Well, again, good morning, church family. How many of you have experienced God's greatness this week? And if you didn't raise your hand, it's because you didn't see God's greatness. Because God is great. God is good all the time. So as you can tell, I'm definitely not Pastor Andrew. Pastor Andrew is out what he deems as celebrating the birth of a new son. And I think we actually have a picture. I'm really kind of disappointed. I was expecting a few, oh, but none. Wow, I'm surprised. This is Hudson James. He was born Thursday afternoon, weighing a whopping 8 pounds, 12 ounces, and was 21 inches long. So they are, everyone is doing well. Uh, he, they got to come home yesterday, late afternoon. Uh, so Pastor Andrew said he's getting about three hours of sleep at a time, so that's good. And again, why I say Pastor Andrew says it's a celebration to me, if that was at my house, whew, mercy, I would not be celebrating. But as I look and I know that this is Pastor Andrew's and not mine, I will celebrate with him. So please be in prayer for them. Uh, he will be out uh, this week, and um, I'll actually be filling in for him again next week. So um, please have grace and mercy and uh, show up. I would hate for him to find out that there were only 100 people here because he's not here. So anyway, I want to thank God first and foremost for the opportunity to stand before you and preach his holy word today. I want to thank Pastor Andrew for the confidence to allow me to do such as well. So today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Um, I'm going to get through hopefully about half of chapter 1 this week and as uh, the, if the plans stay the same, I will finish up chapter 1 next week. So I'll give you a little bit of time uh, to study ahead. But I truly love the book of Philippians. Philippians is a fantastic book. Uh, we know that it was written by Paul, as I will discuss in a little bit. But there are so many incredible themes that really filter through the book of Philippians. And as we will see as we get into this, the main thing theme is Christ Jesus which, if you've done any study of the Bible whatsoever, the main theme of the entire Bible is Jesus Christ. Every single thing from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ is the theme. So I want you to just keep that in mind as we uh, go through this. But Paul was such an incredible guy. I mean, the story of his change, of how he went from being Saul, the persecutor, really fighting against Christians and the church, to a person that literally wrote 13 out of 27 books of the New Testament. That is no accolades to Paul. That is all to Christ Jesus. It is God. God is the only one that can change someone so drastically. So many of you may say, well, I'm too bad for God. No. I promise you, you have not lived a life like Paul did when he was Saul. So, as we dig in, let's read Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you, will bring it to the completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, again, I come to you. Out of utter despair, God, there is nothing that I can do on my own. God, I pray right now that you will just allow your spirit to flow freely in and through me. God, I have nothing to offer them but the gospel. Nothing but your word. But God, that is all they need. So God, I pray right now that you will just bind Satan, bind the distractions, bind anything that is going to prevent us from hearing your word today. God, again, I pray for the one here that does not know you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. God, may you draw them with the Holy Spirit. May they see and understand their need for a Savior. God, there is nothing that we can do to be righteous in your eyes except 
have Christ as Savior. So God, be with us during this time. And God, I want to lift up every other church. God, if it's in a building like this, or if it's in a school, if it's in a home, God, I pray right now that there will be a supernatural revival amongst churches today. God, I pray that there will be a great awakening today, that we can look back on today and say, God surely showed up. God, we are in desperate need of your touch. We pray all of this in the name of Christ Jesus, the only name that saves. Amen. All right, so as Paul starts there, he says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. So we know that Paul is the one that authored uh, Philippians. He used Timothy as the one who literally transcribed or dictated, wrote, wrote physically uh, the letter for Paul. So please do not get him confused as being a co-author or anything like that. But Paul immediately identifies himself and his role. Now, again, you would think that someone that wrote 13 out of 27 New Testament books would identify himself as a little bit more than a servant. I mean, we didn't write 13 out of 27 books, and how many of us are willing to say, I am a servant of Christ Jesus? But then he goes down, he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with overseers and deacons. So now Paul identifies who his audience is, who the recipient of this letter is, and he's writing to the church of Philippi. But one thing I want to point out to you, notice what he says, Christ Jesus is mentioned for the second time already. So the first part of verse 1, he says, servants of Christ Jesus. Now he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. So then he goes on to say, overseers and deacons. Now this is very important because I want you to understand that this was not written, written to a specific group. It was not written to a specific person, but it was written to the entire church of Philippi. So who are those people? The overseers or bishops were called the elders. Now, if you read Titus chapter 1, verse 5, that'll tell you a little bit more about that and explain that to you in a little bit better detail. And I'm not going to camp out there, but it says it, literally an elder we do not have, but it was one that is shepherd or overseen, pastoring the flock. So it is one that has some authority. Now, in today's society, we would see us as pastors also called elders as well. But then he goes down to the term deacons. The deacons were those church leaders who had special service responsibility in the assembly. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 6, it gives you all the details of that. But a deacon is a servant. A deacon is created, and their obligation is to serve the body of the church. So he, again, calls them out specifically. But then he goes down. In verse 2, he says, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very customary uh, greeting that Paul used throughout his writings. But one thing is very, very important there. Look at the order in which you see grace and peace. Without grace, there is no peace. If you don't have the grace of God in your life, you will never be at peace with anything in life. So he says, grace to you and peace from God. Then he says... From God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice that we see for the third time in two verses the term Jesus Christ there. There are many topics throughout the book of Philippians, but Jesus is first and foremost. And I think it's very important to understand that from the very beginning, Paul doesn't beat around the bush. Paul doesn't go out and say, hey, y'all need to do this. Hey, you need to do that. It's not a self-help book. It's not any of those things. It is simply about Christ Jesus. Now, what we will see out of that as a way that we bring honor and glory to Christ, he gives us some of those things to do. So Paul has gotten the introduction out of the way. Now he begins to share how Christ Jesus is glorified. I love how Paul writes. Paul is one of those very nice, very uplifting, very soft-spoken guys, right? Absolutely not. Everything that I just said, he's the complete opposite of. Paul is very direct. Paul is very stern. Paul has been known to um, probably not be politically correct all the time. And I love that. Because, look, there is no political correctness in God's Word. God's Word is truth. God's Word is infallible. God's Word is perfect. And there's no sense in being someone that takes this Word and breaks it apart and tries not to hurt anybody's feelings. 
Because, see, I'm probably, good chance, good possibility, I'm probably going to say something that makes you mad today. But you know what? It's not me. I am doing nothing other than being a messenger of what God says. The tragedy becomes is when a church or a man of God or a woman of God that is teaching others does not hold fast to the Word of God. Look, there's some really good, ooey-gooey, loving stuff in Scripture. Yes, absolutely. But there's also some stuff that's going to smack you in the forehead. And you see, God put that there because He knew we were knuckleheads, and He knew we needed to be smacked in the head a couple of times. Okay, there's one other that agrees with me here. So the rest of y'all are just really good people, okay? Thank you. I'm glad I'm not on that island alone. But again, he uses very specific language, so let's dig in. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul immediately starts with the praise of the church of Philippi. He gets his greeting out of the way. He gets his introduction out of the way. He identifies why he's writing, who he's writing to, all that good stuff. But Paul is about, in context, Paul's about 800 miles away from the church of Philippi. He has not seen them in approximately 8 to 10 years. And guess where he's writing from? Prison. So you're thinking, man, this should be good, right? The guy hadn't seen him in a while. He's a long way from him. But look at the very first thing he says. I thank my God. So he identifies his relationship with God. And then he says, in all my remembrance of you. Basically, he says, every time I pray and think about you guys, I thank God. How many of you have a person in your life that carries that same impact? How many of you have someone in your life that you haven't seen in 8 to 10 years, but every time you think of them, you're thinking, God, thank you for putting that person in my life. Every time he thinks about them, he takes the time to intentionally thank God for them. What if we flip this around? I'm just, this is just a little pry here, okay? So bear with me. How many people can say that about you? How many people that haven't seen you in 8 to 10 years say, God, I am sure grateful for blank, and put your name in that box? You see, we as believers, we should be the epitome of that. We should be the people that when, when they don't see us all the time, they're going through a difficult time, and they think back to us, and they're like, God, thank you for putting Bob in my life. God, thank you for the impact. Thank you for the courage. God, thank you for the perseverance that he lived as a godly man of God. Thank you that I got to experience him. So it's an encouragement for us to live according to God's word. Then verse 4 says, Always in every prayer of mine, for you all, again, talking to the entire church there, making my prayer with joy. So Paul says, when I pray for you, it's a joy. It's easy to pray for people that are a joy, right? What he's trying to say there is, don't be the person that when someone sees you coming down the hallway, they turn and go the other way. Now, we don't have any of those at Kernan. So if you're a guest, welcome to the friendliest church in Jacksonville. But you see, all too often, we as the church, as believers, when we leave the, the campus today, and we go to our job tomorrow morning, we turn into someone other than we are today. You see, our work environment, you know, they may not even know we go to church on Sunday. They may not even know that you are a believer. You may be the grumpiest, old, young, fill-in-the-blank person there is. You see, this is contrary to God's Word. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we are a new creation. The old has passed away. So you need to take all your grumbling, all your belly aching, and, and, and dis get rid of it. Because you're a new creation. God has done a great work in you. Don't be that grump. Don't be that sour-faced, complaining, lying, 
cheating individual. When people think of a Christian, they should say, hey, I know one and he is a fantastic man. I know one and he is a, and she is a great, oh, that was real bad. He and she don't go together. Okay, sorry. She has been a true blessing to me. She has always been there to encourage me. She has always been there to pray for me. Let us be that person. The Church of Philippi. Man, if, if we go out to a local restaurant and say, hey, do you know anything about Colonel Boulevard Baptist Church? Yeah. I know that the people, when they come in on Sundays, they don't tip well. They say they go to church there. They're always grumbling. Never, the food's always too hot or too cold. Kind of like Goldilocks, too hot, too cold, too big, too small. Guys, we should not be that way. Then verse 5 says, Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So because you have to look back to verse 4, and, and what is he saying because of? He is thankful for them because they have such fond memories of them. Why? Because in verse 5 it says, of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until the time he wrote this letter. You see, Paul's not having fond memories of them because they went and played golf all the time. You see, Paul doesn't love them because they went shopping together. It wasn't that Paul loved eating with them. It literally was the focus of Paul's ministry, and that is the gospel. He says, you guys have been faithful. He says, you have been an encouragement from the very first day. And look, it's been 10 years since I've seen you, and I'm in prison now, but you still haven't forgotten me. How many times do we forget people? How many times do we get mad at people and understand, oh, man, I'm just not going to talk to them anymore because they made me mad 10 years ago? Get over it. I tell you what, you can hold it against them if you're perfect. If you've never made a mistake, you hold it against them. But if you have made a mistake in your life, why in the, why in the Sam Hill should you expect everybody else to be perfect? You see, we all have flaws. We all mess up. That's why we need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Get over it. But then he goes on down. Verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Now this verse should help each and every one of us have hope. It should give us some giddy up. It gives us a kick in the rear every single day of our life. Why? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's three important truths that I want you to see there. Number one, it tells us that God has a plan for your life. Every single person in here, God has a plan for your life. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how middle-aged you are. It doesn't matter how mature you are. It doesn't matter about your intellect. It doesn't matter about your personality. That is, that's nothing to do with it. God has a plan. He created you specifically for that plan. Number two, it tells me that God is in control of that plan. You see, a lot of times we think we're in control of our own life. We think we're in control of our own destiny. We think that we actually get to run our life. Well, if you call yourself a believer, then you should know that that's total opposite because you die to yourself daily. We should be allowing the Holy Spirit. We should be allowing God to literally control us in everything that we do. And then here it is, number three. He tells me that he will not give up on me. He says, the one that began a good work in you, that is God, will bring it to completion. To me, probably two of my favorite words in the entire Bible, when they're put together, God will. You see, if I go to my wife or if I go to my kids and say, I will... I'm going to let them down. Not, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not intentionally. But listen to me. When God says, when the Bible says God will, he must do it. If he does it, it means he is a liar. It means that the Bible is, is not infallible. It literally means if God will, it means it will happen. 
He's not going to give up on me. He will bring it to completion. So God has a plan for each of us individually. God is in control of that plan. God will not give up on us until that plan is complete. Listen, here we go. Y'all probably don't remember doing this, but everybody take a breath. Okay. While there is breath in your lung, God has a purpose for you. I don't care if you're five. I don't care if you're 95. If you're still here, if you are still breathing, God has something for you to do. The question becomes, are you doing it? The question becomes, are you grudgingly doing it? Are you doing it with rejoicing? Are you doing it with grumbling? You see, it's real easy for us. I'm sorry. Y'all are way more spiritual than me. It's real easy for me to see God's plan in my life and be like, uh uh-uh, God, I don't think so. God, that requires way too much work. God, that requires way too much education. God, that requires way too much time. God, that requires way too much effort. I think I'll go this route. But you see, God knows what's best for us. And if we understand this, as we continue to dig into this, if we understand the kingdom impact that God's plan has for us, then we will always do it rejoicingly. This is Paul in prison. Not the ideal situation, right? Then verse 7, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, Because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers of me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So again, who is Paul writing to? He says, I am thankful to the elders or the deacons or the worship leaders or the teachers or ushers. No. He says, I am literally thankful for you all. Why? Because they never gave up on him. They continued to show the love, the grace, and the mercy of God to him. Not only that, he says, you are continuing to defend the gospel. You see, Paul's got kingdom mindset here. It's not that they were sending support to him. It's not that they were encouraging him. Yeah, that was part of it. But he understood the most important thing is they have not fallen away from their faith. They have not given up because Paul is going through this difficult time. And honestly, Paul is probably writing this letter because they're going through a difficult time and they're experiencing some of the trials of life as well. Who have you given up on? Who do you refuse to forgive? Have you given up on God? Maybe you're just being disobedient to God. Listen, don't give up. Why? Verse 8. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So Paul conveys his sincerity here as he states, God is my witness. He's saying, guys, I'm trying to be as sincere and as truthful to you guys. He said he yearns for them. He yearns for them. There is a longing deep down within him, in his heart, within his soul, to be with them. Okay, I've been nice up until this point. Here's where I'm going to dig in. It's only going to be just just briefly, okay? I'm not going to camp out there. What would it take to yearn for our community with the affection of Christ Jesus? What would it take to yearn for our community, our neighbors, our coworkers, the people in your sphere of influence? What would it take for us to yearn for them with the affection of Christ Jesus. As difficult as this is to say, I don't think we're doing that. I don't yearn for my community like I should. How do you know that? When's the last time you shared the gospel? When's the last time you invited someone to church? When we don't love and care for them, and when we, we, won't, we won't even talk to our neighbors because they don't look like us or talk like us or act like us, we have no yearning. 
Shame on us. I'm in that boat. For not seeing and loving the people around us the way that Jesus does. Why do we think we're so much better? We are no different. We are sinners saved by grace. Verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment, with knowledge and all discernment. This should be a daily prayer for every person that calls themselves a Christian. Why? Because we will never reach anyone without the abundant love of Jesus flowing in and through us. As I stated earlier, I can't do anything on my own. We can't even love anyone on our own. Why? Because love is from God. God is love. Without, him, uh, uh, without us allowing that abundant love to flow in us, then we will never love anyone else. Amy Carmichael says, You can always give without loving, but you can never love without giving. You can always give without loving, but you can never love without giving. Well, what are we to give? The gospel. We are to give the good news. We are to give hope, love, mercy, grace, and eternal life. That's all. Just the gospel. You see, we have what every single person is looking for. You see, the gospel is everything. Every single person needs the gospel. You know, I like to use the illustration of if your loved one was uh, diagnosed with cancer and you found out that I had just developed the cure for cancer and you come to me and say, hey, my loved one is about to pass with cancer. Can I have the cure? And I say, nope. What are your thoughts going to be about me? Probably can't say I'm in church, right? Well, you see, we have hope. We have grace, we have mercy, we have love, we have forgiveness, we have righteousness, we have eternal life, not us individually, but we know the source of that. And if we're not sharing that with others, shame on us. But then he goes on down. Not only should we ask for love to abound, but may our love abound with knowledge and all discernment. This means our love should be rooted in God's Word and that the Holy Spirit should have control of our lives every single day. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and 19. Paul says, imagine that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints with what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth, and the, to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. If we are not rooted and grounded in God's love, we are no good to God. We are no good to others, and we are no good to ourselves. Then verse 10 so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So Paul gives two purposes for his prayer here. Number one, we are to discern what is best. He doesn't say discern what is good. How many of you understand there is a difference between what is good and what is best? And then number two, to be pure and blameless. When we discern something, it means that it literally has been tested uh, much the same way of metals being tested to meet a certain standard. We should do the same. The reason, that why, the reason why they should abound in love and knowledge and depth of insight is to discern what is best for our lives. Love seeks what is best for the other person but what is best may not always be obvious. You see, guys, how many times have you bought a gift for your wife and you thought, this is going to be a slam dunk, best gift of all time? She opens a present and she's like, uh. 
might have been a good present, right? Might have been a good gift, something she wanted, could have used, but it wasn't what was best. You see, we should seek after the best. What is the best? God is the best. God is above all things. Then he goes to number two, the, the pure aspect. Remember who Paul is writing to, the church. He is not writing to this specific person. He is praying for the church to be pure and blameless. The moral meaning of pure denotes being sincere without hidden motives or pretense. All too often, we as a church do things with the wrong motive. We want to see our attendance increase. We want to see our giving increase. We want to do this or we want to do that. Are those pure motives? You see, God understands why we do what we do. He understands our heart. Colossians 3.23, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And then blameless. This is the same word Paul used in 1 Corinthians when he said, Do not cause anyone to stumble. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is watching us. We must act different. We must look different. Now, I'm not talking about being all freaky crazy out there, okay? But people should be able, without you saying a word, someone should look at you and say, there's something different about that guy in a good way. That person must be a Christian, man. I don't ever see him do anything inappropriate. I don't ever hear him say bad words. I don't, look, we are to love people. The world doesn't teach love, only love of self. But Christianity, God's word teaches us that we are to love God first, and then we are to love others. We are to love others as we love ourselves. Do you love your neighbor like you love yourself? Paul's description of the fruit as fruit of righteousness may be interpreted in two ways. Righteousness is the source of the fruit, or righteousness is the nature of the fruit. In this context, there are two meanings of righteousness that can simply be stated as legal. It talks about a legal right standing before God. See, that's why Christ had to shed his blood so that we could be made righteous or called righteous, have his righteousness in us to be in right standing with God, and then the right ethical moral behavior. Righteousness only comes through Jesus Christ, and we are made righteous for God's honor and for God's glory. It's not so that we can be better than anybody else. It's not so we can be a holier than thou. It's not any of those reasons. The only reason we are to be made righteous is to bring honor and glory to God. Church family, we have got to do a better job of being obedient to God's word. We, look, I, as Paul says, I'm the chief sinner, I think I've taken that title. I'm nothing. I fail miserably every single day. If you don't believe that, go ask my wife, my son, my daughter. Most of you probably know I fail daily. But if we have the love of God in us, why can't we take that out there and love others? You see, I think a lot of the reason is because I don't think we love God like we should. Because I believe that when we're in intimate fellowship with God, when we have the Word of God flowing in and through us, when we are being consumed by the Holy Spirit, it should be natural. Because we are a new creation. God has made us new. He has made us loving, caring, to show grace, to show mercy. But all too often we go out into the world and we respond just like they do. So as we close today... I want you to just examine your life. Think about, could anyone that you know refer back to you as a true believer? A man of God, a woman of God. Can they rejoice every time they think about you? Every time that they pray, is, is your name in there as a blessing? Or are you one of those people that are just miserable, 
They're grumbling. They're lying. They're cheating. You see, we will stand before God one day and give an account of the things that we've done or not done. 